evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the last night of the of AICH's Women's Gathering. My name is Jolie Cloutier. I am from the Onondaga Nation, and I'm going to read a few quick things to you, and then I'm going to hand it over to our guest presenter tonight. Um, first and foremost, the mission of the American Indian Community House is to improve and promote the well-being of the American Indian community and to increase the visibility of American Indian cultures in an urban setting in order to cultivate awareness, understanding, and respect. AICH is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization serving the needs of Native Americans residing in New York City. The intention of the women's gathering is to provide a space for any and all Native women, femme, non-binary slash tr transgender relatives to offer relevant, informative, and art-related workshops in a space to gather and celebrate amongst one another. The gathering is a two day long virtual session today and tomorrow via Zoom due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The sessions are for us and by us. This year's theme is nurturing and grounding, including sessions on food sovereignty, indigenous futurism, midwifery slash caregiving and women's health. The result is to have the participants walk away feeling grounded in community with access to resources and a strengthened community. Uh, tonight's guest is Mohawk midwife and environmentalist Gachi Cook, who will lead a presentation about her work, followed by a private Zoom only Q&A session. And I'll hand it over to Gachi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening from here in Akwazasne, where I live along uh, my ancestors' lands on Cook Road. Uh, my Cook ancestors have occupied this particular space of Akwazasne for many generations. And I'm uh, the matriarch of a generation of grandchildren who live across the road from me and uh, across the reservation from me. And I'm currently waiting on uh, the birth of um, our 12th grandchild. Um, and so uh, I uh, thank you, all of you, for your patience uh, with me um, being a bit preoccupied in all of the uh, supportive work uh, that needs to go on. And uh, in the world that I work in and approach the work of midwifery is informed by the superlatives of our culture. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of those elements this evening. I'm not speaking from a prepared paper. Uh, I've done that uh, several times in this past uh, fall season. Um, I most enjoy direct interaction with uh, young women, young people, uh, young uh, travelers on the path of life path of healing journey of uh, becoming. As uh, a dear friend, uh, Nora Naranjo Morris from the Kapo Tewa says, we are always beginning. And so in our communities, that holds true as well. There needs to be uh, every generation always carrying it further. <clears throat> it is into that kind of reality that I was born at home in 1952, just on the road, on State Road, where the Hearn side of my family comes from, the Hearn lands. And uh, my grandmother, who is the elder midwife who delivered me in her big white iron bed in Akwazasne, uh, she was a Hearn and her husband, my grandfather, was Louis Cook from over here on Cook Road. Um, and so I situate myself, like I like to say, in the river. Uh, the waters of this area are swampy and uh, but beautiful, full of life. The purpose of these waters, these, this kind of uh, uh, ecology, ecological space has to do with uh, the water 
and uh, all of our relatives who occupy the same grounds, uh, deer, beaver, all kind of birds, um, the fish, of course, mink, um, uh, turkey, wild turkey, um, uh, a, a great diversity of life uh, that supports everything that makes us want our culture to continue, to continue to be able to, uh, to, to put forward from those cultural superlatives a design of, the, of, of our environments that is sustainable, that will work for uh, our future generations. And so what was left in my family through my grandmother was this kind of way to relate to one another. Uh, they call it uh, midwife, a wonderful word uh, of English, German extraction means with woman. Uh, but working in this community with um, wonderful uh, elders like Marita Thompson, who served as um, an educator for the First Environment Collaborative back in the 1980s and 90s, who had made a drawing of, uh, of the classic iconic birthing medicine of our Mohawk people. And how many people use this Slipriyama Hosala medicine. And she used that tree in her art to um, illustrate a mother with long hair being the bark of the slippery elm holding an infant in her arms. And she painted many other trees around that one. And she said, look, Gudgy, this is how our women are in community. We're trees that grow together. And in fact, now we know that in the medicine of the trees, they, they relate to each other through the root system underground, um, have a sense of how, based on the conditions of their environment, the amount of sunlight, the length of the day, the kind of weather, the rain, all of that, they'll nourish each other uh, at the root system so that the forest um, can live. And, to me, that's the, the brilliance of our communities is that we still have uh, kinship structures. Our genealogical society here is mapping through the generations to make sure the uh, evidence of uh, who we are and what we are about. Um, the, the history is, is sacred. As, the, as is the language, the land, and all of these different ways that we use to keep ourselves well, to keep our families healthy. Uh, and so inside of that whole uh, ecosystem of knowing and of being and of doing um, sits the, the midwifery. But uh, getting back to Marita Thompson, she said to me, um, that word ecology, it sounds like the word for this image of the slippery elm tree, oncology, which is uh, uh, a representation of those relationships within the slippery elm and the mothering and um, the slippery. And uh, she said, we must be oncologists. It sounds a lot like, like the word ecologist. And so this oncology, um, world that this knowledge lives in <clears throat> comes to us through the kinship structures and the relationships of the different extended families. So in starting to uh, consider how to adapt my grandmother's ways the stories of who she was and, and the birth she, she'd done in this community. Uh, there were other midwives in Gawahinoge and Yusnayne and all the different uh, main communities within the larger community called Akusasne. And I made it my business at a very young age to uh, 
to listen to the grandmothers and the conversations they would have and to listen for those specific things that uh, flagged something special about uh, how we're supposed to be around, uh, really around reproduction, not just of bodies, but of, uh, of culture, of a way to be together. <clears throat> and so uh, the stories that are carried <clears throat> from my grandmother's practice, my Aunt Betty, the mother of two sets of twins born at home, delivered by my grandmother, um, the stories my Aunt Betty shared with me about my grandmother's practice, who she delivered. Um, and so all along Cook Road, the Cook relatives that married and carried other names, like uh, you must all remember the swamps, Jake and Judy Swamp, Jake's mother, Leo, was a cook. And so uh, the, the kinship world is what is represented in this new life that's coming. Um, and so in in a midwifery that is considered within this frame of the oncologist, <clears throat> the cultural, uh, spiritual ecologist, um, sits these stories that share with us, not just um, a specific body of knowledge, but because Mohawk and I'm not a fluent speaker, but I love my language. And um, I resource the concepts embedded in the language to um, strengthen whatever it is you're going to put your intention towards. And so whether it's a birth or the fulfillment of a dream or in the enactment of ceremony, uh, all of these are tied together within this uh, social, cultural, spiritual space that I'm uh, attempting to share with you to give your uh, perspectives of what we call midwifery uh, in terms of an indigenous uh, construction of a co-construction as we practice we bring together those knowledge bases that uh, we've been taught or that we've been shown. And so back to the stories. Um, through time, you track <clears throat> the threads of story, just as uh, we see at the chromosomes, the level of the chromosomes, the threads uh, of the, um, the chromosomes will they'll dance, they'll line up, they'll switch position. And it's in, in that kind of genetic gear that, um, you know, a new, uh, 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 we reproduce our own selves and we reproduce other bodies. And so uh, there's so much to know in terms of the physical, uh, which I like to focus on, um, the embryogenetic patterns that persist through a lifetime um, and to, to use some of that knowledge base um, to really move things forward, whether it's with your own self, another individual, a family, uh, or a community. There are different levels of work involved in midwifery at all of those levels, of course. As with everything that we connect to within our communities, to make to make a safe place for our people, for our women, for our children, and our infants. Um, and so I I promised to talk this evening. I thought to talk about this. Um, uh, larger perspective from an indigenous midwife of uh, this ecosystem of the woman's body 
that uh, in considering uh, what our women are, are presenting with, um, this idea of layers of environment, um, of meaning of the indigenous woman's body. And this is from which we build and revise uh, systems of taking care of mothers and babies. And so, of course, there's the cosmological, the story of creation, uh, a body of, of um, image and uh, symbol and language that brings uh, meaning to our lives um, to live a cosmologically meaningful life, as was quoted uh, by Jung in uh, Sabini in uh, 2010. So these interesting connections. Um, so for example, of the cosmological and mythological element of uh, midwifery or of this oncology approach is this idea of the restoration of sacred knowledge, of ceremony, of symbol systems, and uh, narrative beyond story, which is uh, noun, verb, you know, and then you get to the end. There's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. But the narrative is a, is a larger arc that frames the different stories. And so when we look at the stories of elder women like my grandmother and birth, you find things like um, a set of twins. She often delivered twins uh, who the mother was put with one cheek on one kitchen chair and another cheek on uh, a, a next chick, uh, kitchen chair with space enough in between that she could uh, feel the contraction and uh, such a, an elder woman gone now I visited and she would say how my grandmother never let her um, sit in labor, that she would always keep her up and moving. And um, when it came to deliver the twins, she would catch them in between the space of those two kitchen chairs where the woman would sit and the chairs were situated just so that there would be a way to catch those babies with the woman uh, on those chairs. So, but even deeper threads are found inside of um, this idea of community midwives, such as we're lucky to have here in Akwazasne with student midwives training uh, with a senior midwife and available to the community, um, which wasn't the case when I was uh, a young Mohawk mother at the age of 23 looking for a midwife. Um, the closest I could come, I was living in St. Regis and uh, there was a wonderful character in my childhood that I knew at 23, uh, who walked down the St. Regis road with a corn cob pipe and a, a French beret. Her name meant um, she wears a hat. And in my later years, learned more about this wonderful woman. And uh, by the time I was looking for a midwife, I went to her house not far from uh, that turn, that bend in St. Regis where the church is. She lived not far from there. And I went to ask her to deliver my baby at home. And she said, I, I'm blind now. I can't even find my way across a room. Um, but I'll give you the medicine to take uh, to make you have an easy birth. And she gave me slippery elm uh, in those last weeks. Uh, that really is a wonderful medicine that um, uh, causes the columnar cells at the cervix to proliferate as they're uh, meant to do during uh, pregnancy and the uh, uh, at, at the behest of progesterone. So um, it, we find in these threads of stories through the generations, different elements um, that inform us about the connection of um, birth 
to ceremony and to dream. And so out of living this practice for uh, a number of years, feeling, um, having a vision, um, a singular um, experience in the dream state of seeing at a time when I thought for sure midwifery would not come back to our communities, that uh, a new law was opened in the Ontario provinces and uh, acting uh, into the opportunity, um, we were able to create something pretty wonderful in Ontario. Excuse me. And so I wish, um, anyway, I'll finish this layered environments. Um, so the birthing center at Six Nations, the curriculum for training midwives began with the, uh, the creation story and followed some of the uh, elements that we see in the fall of that magnificent uh, ancient ancestor. Um, and of course, the story contains metaphor, territorial ecosystems, this metaphor of the body and landscape. Um, where we are told the site of her landing is now what's called Manitoulin Island. And having been there with Jan Longboat uh, many years ago, doing a healing lodge at a wonderful restaurant on Walpole or Manitoulin Island, where we were served apple pie. Uh, the apples came from the tree right on the restaurant grounds. And um, there's many special things about Manitoulin Island as um, that contain seeds that Sky Woman carried to this world. And so there's a lot to be done yet in this world of restoring women's knowledge and along in at the center of that is this idea of um, pulling the baby out of the water out of the earth or a dark wet place and so it's in darkness that we are conceived and grow in the earth and womb of the mother and uh, it is uh, looking at what's going on in, in the body of the woman in these contexts of um, seeing that as the first environment, women are at the center of this larger territory, this larger cosmic story. Um, and then you have history and all that we've been through. Um, I just watched a, a wonderful film, a sad film of when the train bridge accident in Quebec occurred and one of the three surviving Mohawk fathers of over 30 men who perished in the collapse of that train bridge. Uh, my grandfather, Thomas Ganadogoya de Montour, uh, was one of three survivors. And so in our histories, there's these tracks and um, they come out of the depth of each of our being. Um, and so inside of this bigger story, a woman presents for care. There is her kinship, her identity, who she is, and has she been ritualized? And uh, what are her intentions in time, in terms of replicating culture? Um, the breastfeeding, the um, commercialism around um, a baby these days, um, when really uh, we know from all that we've learned about violence and trauma, how there has to be attention paid during the pregnancy, during the birth, during the postpartum period, and on and on and on, even until you're old, whatever you consider old to be. Um, and so situating 
ideally, I know this is optimum, but these societies that we come from uh, are still possible. And not only possible, there are in those behaviors things we need to carry forward. Um, and so the biological piece um, of her uh, that ties into her own psycho spiritual life. Um, and so one of the big differences that um, would be between me and say one of my colleagues, 75 colleagues in the Michener, Michener pre-registration program in Toronto, to bring previously practicing lay midwives up to standards, which meant uh, research-based practice. And so we carry these two realities of being responsible uh, for a life and another life as well. And then the kinship structure that she presents with, uh, which is, you want that to be optimum. And uh, so you follow uh, the medicines to help that family uh, who are going to change their whole identity based on a baby's birth. Um, and so the significance of what I'm talking about when you bundle it all together um, has to do with the relationship of the individual woman within her vision of the cosmos. This relationship between what goes on on the earth, uh, goes on in the sky, um, uh, just the knowledge that one has to navigate can also be found within the language of the woman's dreams. And it may be only one meaningful dream. You know when a dream is a meaningful dream, a true dream, when maybe the emotion of it's gonna wake you, um, or there's gonna be uh, something that you bring into your waking life that tells you you need the dream to be interpreted, or that the images are so strong you already uh, know what the dream means. And so um, I've had mothers tell me, oh, God, gee, I don't dream. And then at the last two weeks before the baby's due, she's got a baby who's breech. You send her, you can send her to a chiropractic to do that, uh, is it uh, Baxter's Reap, where you flip the baby head down. Um, there are chiropractic uh, uh, manipulations that can accomplish that. It's in the literature. Um, and, and then she may, for whatever reason, have a meaningful dream. Uh, one such dream is a woman walking through underbrush, getting scratched up till she comes into a mature forest. And she's walking a trail in this mature forest and she comes to this place where there's an opening kind of round in the trees. And she sees this little girl, maybe 18 months old, old enough to stand up on her two feet and she's lost. So the woman embraces the little girl and takes her out of the forest, this dark forest. And so in her birth, uh, she asked me to follow her to the hospital for a second birth. And uh, the staff was so busy, emergency sections, nurses are busy, and they're giving this woman a lot of room and a lot of respect because she deserves it. And uh, I was there with her and at one point put her in the, a dark uh, hospital lavatory with her husband on one side and me on the other, turn out the lights, turn on the water, ask the water to guide her, 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 the flow going on inside of the waters in, in her, in the dark, and then ask her, repeat after me, I can do this. And you get the one, I can, I can do this, louder. And by the time you get to the third louder, the nurses are running, wondering what the noise is about because she's found, she's opened her, her voice. 
And I think if there's any um, underlying knowledge that, that midwives or birth workers need to deeply know is how important the nervous system is to our body's function and how this old wandering nerve that comes from the back of our brain stem travels through and connects to our larynx, our voice box, down into our stomach. It's, and it connects through the viscera, the organs, to the cervix. And this wandering ancient nerve uh, works outside of the uh, spine and the brain stem. It's that old in our development through time. And uh, that's why when we talk about woman's voice, when we talk about uh, birth, we have to see the connection between how we will say to a woman, don't be singing arias when you're in labor, meaning you're not tightening that voice box very narrow. It, it closes your cervix, that kind of articulation. Uh, and so we always will guide them to the lowering of the, the breath onto the diaphragm and opening the larynx broadly so that you have an open voice box and it helps open the cervix. So I'm sure that this audience that cares to watch and uh, I sure wish we were in conversation instead of you being talked at. Um, I can't see you, you can see me. Um, but there are deeper things to know depending on how you want to design your practice around these things. And uh, for me, it was paying attention to the clan mothers, to the grandmothers. Uh, I'm following a track right now, one of these threads that um, I heard from Ruth Hearn, who was one of the circle of my grandmother's cousins that a country doctor, David Gorman, paid attention to because none of the women were having uh, hospital births, they were having home births. So he was trying to train them to deliver babies at home. There's many beautiful stories between he and my grandmother when she would call him, he had a lot of respect for her. And his son, who at that time was a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, would come with his father in his old model Ford Model T and come to my grandmother's house. And uh, David Corman's father would tell him, you sit in the car while I'm busy. And my grandmother would always insist that he come into her kitchen and have a piece of her homemade apple pie and uh, milk just fresh from the cow that morning. And so I was lucky to be able to work with this young boy who became an obstetrician once there was such a specialty and uh, just enjoyed uh, his support both for my own births. I have a birth documented in Joy Harjo's early publication, Reinventing the Enemy's Language. And, uh, and so this idea of um, the cosmological, the mythological, territorial, historical, sociological, and biological, those are big words, right? But they try to encapsulate uh, this integration of uh, what we're seeing and how we're trained. Uh, you got to be able to understand and interpret lab results and all the other uh, elements of good safe care. But that safety also lives in our cultural world um, where we are the first environment as women because of the um, biological integrity over long epochs of time that when they find that 130,000 year old bone somewhere in Central America and realize humans have been here a lot longer than they thought, it's the mitochondrial DNA, the mothers, the grandmothers, the ancestral DNA that identifies um, the, 
the body well it's a bone but it's part of the body and where the spirit uh, lives and so the um the the nuclear dna the male dna has a great legacy to hand down um but it's uh it doesn't last it doesn't it degrades uh in the environment and so uh the marker for identity um biologically at least has that significance through the woman's line uh, but here at Akwazasni we have strong patriarchies and uh I'm on the road of one of my own, uh, my grandfather, Louis Cook, who was one of like 13 boys that my grandpa, his, his dad, Louis Cook, all the way back to the ancestor that signed the Indian Meadows Treaty of 1796 and is well known in history. Um, I'm not sure it's 747 and people must have questions. I've been generally rambling along because there's really too much to tell. And it's strange telling it where I don't see your faces. And uh, uh, I haven't prepared a paper. I've written tons about this, some lot not published. So I guess I'll spend these last few minutes telling you about the Spirit Aligned Leadership Program at www.spiritaligned.org, all lowercase. Um, uh, and so we have a circle three application, meaning we're looking for eight <laughs> uh, st strong legacy leader type elders uh, and a future legacy leader that she has a spirited collaboration with for one year to gain support, to learn an element of our culture, of our ways. Uh, maybe it's language, uh, check out the website. And unfortunately, there's really tight age ranges for the future legacy leader and the legacy leader. So be patient, this is a one year fellowship because of the pandemic pivot. We had a beautiful program design with under our program director, Gail Small, who you may know. And if you don't, you should find out who she is. Uh, she's from Lame Deer, uh, Montana, uh, is Northern Cheyenne. And uh, we put together this design as a team of one year duration, as opposed to our previous first two circles, um, three years of a fellowship award to support their transmission of knowledge to the next generation, depending on their, their specific focus. And as we build up the Spirit Aligned website content of each circle, um, you'll find some amazing podcasts there of these uh, incredible women, these precious elders, um, whose dreams, whose ceremonies, whose voices, have left an imprint on their communities and in many cases on the world. And so Spirit Aligned, uh, for which I serve as founder and executive director, uh, works to um, uplift, to uphold um, the North American indigenous woman elder, her voices, her dreams, uh, her, her knowledge, her capacity, uh, to show to show her the honor she deserves after many years of struggle uh, of uh, revising a system. Uh, Jan Longboat, for example, has uh, assisted in the revision of the indigenous justice uh, world at the Brantford Court. Uh, her story will be on there as well as uh, the other seven in her first circle. And then at the turn of the year, we'll be turning towards our second circle. But this third circle is only one year duration, and I, uh, it's, it's, it's a test. It's an experiment in a time when we can't travel, we can't gather. Um, and so the good news is we're able to connect quite easily on Zoom. Um, 
but still it isn't the same as if you were sitting here with me in my office where I could show you uh, paintings of stories and artifacts of behavior, uh, all the discussions. And so, uh, Maddie, um, can I take questions at this time? Yes, we'd love for you to answer questions. Excuse me. Gachi, if you want to take a look at the chat, there's some questions um, we dropped for you in the chat box. Okay. There's also some more in the comment section, so we're going to copy and paste them for you to read. And Yahweh, my great grandmother was Margaret Gaguileas Jock from Akwazasne. She was a midwife there in the early 1890s, 1920s. She didn't speak English to my mom and her sisters, but would tell them through sign language and through translation with my Dutta to get a root to chew on to help with period cramps. The actual root has been lost through time. Do you know what this may have been? Yes, of course. Uh, the root is uh, Ononoro, uh, sweet flag. Um, one of my thoughts is that I know you're Mohawk if you have a little bit of sweet flag in your purse or your pocket because it's used for anything in the head and the chest, but it uh, it's, has heat in it. And the center of what our grandmothers, our Duras told us had to do with the idea of that the, the uterus is, it, it needs to have heat so that you would always keep that part of the body warm. And I, it could also be a route that I'm uh, paying attention to um, in Mohawk, it translates uh, in the word for house, uh, frog's house, uh, the white lily. Uh, it may be that route, but I am not sure. Um, and what Deona Date from uh, Sugarbush Island showed me or used for me when I had cramps and lived with her to learn language and basket making and just the way she, her consciousness was as a fluent speaker. She was the wife of uh, Dhaji Jakwa, the, the male version of my name, Dhaji Jakwa, uh, that means they're picking up flowers and uh, sponsored my name uh, in, in the longhouse he sat in the title of Ayawata. But anyway, um, she would use wild cherry branches. She we'd go, she'd climb over a fence in those big old shoes and thick old lady stockings and her with her apron on and her print cotton dress. And we'd go get the, the finer tips, the branches of the um, uh, wild cherry bark. And she bundle it, tie it with a cotton string, and put it in a uh, oh couple gallons of water on the stove. Boil it, boil it twenty minutes, and then let it sit. And she would say, "Don't go anywhere when you go to this. When you use Indian medicine, you don't go anywhere. You stay and drink it as hot as you can take it until it's all gone. It was about oh, a gallon a liter uh, to drink." And interesting, the wild cherry bark has the um, inhibitor of prostaglandins in it that causes the cramps because you gotta let that blood out. And so there's uh, some good medicines that we have for, for such a, a problem. Uh, yeah, sweet flag all the time. It, that's, and so we have to really protect the Ononor, okay, uh, Ahom, um, Daino woman traveling down the path of traditional birth work, birth worker aiming to be a traditional med. Wow, wonderful. Uh, New York State, yes, um, they really slammed the door shut on um, traditional midwifery. We've commented from here, uh, my sister cousin Beverly, and of course, Jasmine Benedict. Uh, and myself have um, uh, written 
for an exemption in the New York State midwifery law. But, you know, to change the world takes a good 30, 40, 50 years. And while the law uh, protects, you know, our people as well, um, to build out who we are uh, from an indigenous perspective takes time. You, one of the problems, even though we have over a hundred Aboriginal midwives at, uh, that you can see at um, uh, traditionalmidwifery.com, the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives, indigenousmidwives.ca, something like that. Um, and so New York State, stay a doula, a young woman who wants to practice in the way of her ancestors, not just trained in a Western midwifery system. We have midwives like that who have CNMs uh, and are also registered in Canada and belong to a professional body. Um, and, you know, tell the spirits, make a ceremony, have a prayer, say, this is what I want to do. And I need to know how I'm going to what steps will you put in my path that I can fulfill my vision? And, uh, you know, you have to be humble and you have to be patient. And it may be that you're just creating the road that others are going to follow. But in New York State, um, you know, they do, I highly recommend you pursue the certified professional midwife uh, certification. Um, to ladder your way up, but stay well versed in the Daino. They're writing their language, they're writing their dictionary. Uh, they have their songs, their ceremonies based on the tobacco prayer. My husband's book, um, uh, uh, Dreaming Mother Earth, has a lot of good material in it. And I've seen how they work with massage and the body and the hair pulling that they do. Um, and so my advice is that is, is to continue your prayer, carry your prayer. It's not easy to do, is it? Uh, but I started with a prayer and it's carried me to this moment in my life. What advice do you have for young native nurses and doctors to help our women reclaim prenatal and birth practices that help them reclaim and preserve culture, especially since many are less connected to these teachings? Uh, my friend, um, uh, Paul Stamets, a mycologist well known throughout the world, just funded $50,000 to the University of Arizona to do exactly what you're talking about, to train health professionals in traditional, alter uh, traditional practices that will deepen, the, because you, we all know the pharmaceuticals, there's a lot to be said about them. One of my friends says it's poison. And uh, another friend who is a retired public health uh, worker who used to monitor uh, mercury cell uh, in the environment um, wrote up a whole program on macroepigenetics. Uh, and so there's so much to know, but in the indigeneity of knowledge is these relationships directly to the earth. Go to the earth every time, put tobacco down, make a sacred fire, work in a circle. Uh, you've heard this from all other kind, all other sources as well. Um, and young native nurses and doctors, I have a beloved niece, Dr. Ochisto Horn, who takes care of 15,000 charts in this community. And I told her early on when I met her as a young uh, woman, go to the sun dance, get into the ceremonies, get into the medicine ways because she loved obstetrics and she loves uh, ER at the time I met her. I said, what do you do with all that um, adrenaline? And she said, I just stuff it. And it, eventually I think you can get, you know, a heavy burden from that. And, and now having sun danced, she's brilliant. She's carries her with more aliveness. She has more aliveness, I'll put it that way. Because the helping professions, the relationship building that we all have to do to survive, we're evolved to survive. 
we need to go back to these basic ways and whether my husband says who's Daino himself, whether you go to uh, the north, the south, far south, they use the same ways we do. They use tobacco at the center of everything they do, the four directions. And so I, I just encourage you, uh, young native nurses and doctors, and in the Canadian provinces, the, the, my niece, for example, meets routinely on a Zoom with other native doctors and nurses to share knowledge because she shares it from her own experience of the sweat lodge and the different elements of the Sundance ceremony. It isn't just Sundance, it's the seven sacred rites that go along with that. And I know that because of my work with my sister-in-law, Loretta Afraid of Bear Cook, who you will see on the spiritaligned.org website as a standard bearing example of what a legacy leader is and does. Um, and so that looks like that's about it. Um, thank you for your questions and for, and for knowing as much as you do. Every generation carries it a little bit farther, a little bit further. And I hope that each one of you listening will continue with the same energy that brought you in this direction, that made you look this way, that uh, rebuilding our women's community within our large larger community is part of our resilience and how we're going to stay strong. And uh, I wonder from uh, Jolie, how much time do we have left? We actually have a few minutes left. So at this time, I'm going to invite anybody else who's on the Zoom if they want to turn their cameras on and unmute themselves. We have about 20 minutes left. So anybody on the call can start asking questions. I know that I personally really enjoyed listening to you talk about a lot of this. This is a lot of stuff that I didn't know, and it was so informative. Thank you, Nyawa. Um, if no one has uh, further questions, why don't we do something together? Uh, I would ask you to close your eyes and along with me, uh, take three cleansing breaths. Don't start yet. We'll do it together and uh, breathe through your nose, exhale through your lips. Make a sound if you want, but on the count beginning at one, we'll start our breath and about five, we'll stop and then exhale and we'll do that all together. And then just follow my, my voice with your eyes closed so that we can center ourselves in this wonderful feeling of having spent time together, of feeling reaffirmed uh, and feeling at home in our own selves. So together, uh, take a deep breath. One, five, stop, drop. Back to one. Again. Release. The third time. One, stop, release. Let your shoulders drop. Relax in the space where you sit at the center of your own four directions. Taking your left hand and holding it over your heart at your chest. Feel your heart beating, pumping the oxygen to the fireplace in each cell of your body. And with me, repeat three times together. This is who I am together. This is who I am. Again, this is who I am.
Ayeli ni un cueto que want to go. Asko ya no wose, sayata no no ne aqua wachile. I want to come. What's going on? What's it? Yo ho, ana yo e yo he yo ho, ana yo e yo he yo ha yo yo ha yo, ana yo e yo he yo ho, ana yo e yo he. Kaeli. Ni un cueto que want to go. Osco ya no wose. Sayata no no ne aqua wachile. I want to go. Osco ya no wose. Yo ho. Ana yo we ya he yo ho. Ana yo we ya he. Yo ha yo yo ha yo ana yo e ya he yo ho ana yo e ya he Ayeli ni un cueto que yo want to come Asko ya no wose Sayata no na ne aqua wajile I want to go What's going on was it Yo ho Hana yo e ya he yo ho Hana yo e ya he yo ha yo yo ha yo Hana yo e ya he yo ho Ana yo e yo he Kaeli Ni un cueto que yo want to go Osko ya no wose Sayata no no ne aqua wachile I want to go Osko ya no wose Yo ho Ana yo e ya he yo ho. Ana yo e ya he yo ha yo yo ha yo. Ana yo e ya he yo ho. Ana yo e ya he. Wee. Nyawa to Bear Fox who uh, has agreed to let me use her beautiful song to the four directions, the way we talk to them in our Ahandagari Watekwa, the Thanksgiving address, uh, asking them to look after us to, so that we can look after our families. So Nyawa Bear, uh, uh, and uh, I hope that each of you um, will carry this center inside of your own heart to the work that you do, uh, to the worlds that you serve and live in, and uh, remember to always take good care of yourselves like that. Uh, Dane to. Let's see if there's any more questions. Nyawa goa, do you want to lay? Thank you so with much. Some comments in the chat box. Okay. Um, Any other ideas what could have been in my great Duda's pouch? She also smoked a, smoked a corn cob pipe and would walk all around St. Regis. I spent, I love that story, by the way, Nyawa, for sharing it. Um, uh, the one that hits and opens that sacred uh, original tobacco that I spent the pandemic months uh, from May to September growing uh, out seeds that uh, Mama Bear Wagela uh, Gatste uh, gave to me. Uh, I wanted to grow my own tobacco now that I have my new home here on along Cook Road. And uh, for sure, she had. Uh, the one that we put in the fire when we want to address the great spirits, the cosmic forces that we depend on, that speak to us every day, uh, following cycles of the moon, uh, even when you're old, 
you follow the moon because you're using cleansing medicines. And so Duras uh, have a big pharmacopoeia because by now um, the, the underlying inflammatory processes of aging need to be uh, brought under control so we don't damage our heart, our lungs, other body tissues. Um, the world we live in is very different from our Dura's world, but she for sure carried the uh, uh, Indian tobacco, the sweet flag, and any other medicines. Uh, slippery elm is a good one, uh, rhubarb root, but these are medicines you need to learn in the practice with someone who is their friends, these medicines become good friends. And if you don't grow it of the elder women I've traveled to visit, um, they, they will grow it right around their house. Uh, they know where to get it in the woods, but it comes a time when they'll grow it around their house. Of course, the Ononoro needs to be in a wet area. Um, and so it's not as easy as sticking a root in the ground. You have to pay attention to its where it likes to live. But there's teachings that go with the use of Onanolo too, right? Um, the different uh, words and um, picking it only in a month beginning, ending in the letter R. Um, all of these medicines have personalities like people. Um, Okay, let's see if I can. Yeah, your great, your great daughter's pouch. And probably the most important thing she carried were her stories. That's how we teach. If I were to really uh, get down home with this audience, I would be teaching you from the birthing stories of um, the threads of connection you find in every birth um, that now here in this community, one of the babies whose birth I attended just had a birthday, several of them, in fact, and you see them going into their 30s now and one in his 40s. And um, you, you know, when they're being born, there's different signs, um, not just the mother's dreams, but you pay attention to all of the data, not just you know, what her blood pressure is and the fetal heart rate, that kind of thing. So the stories were also in her pouch. Um, uh, here's one currently on the road back to her nation to prepare for her birth and the comfort of my words. You mentioned you had written works. Do you know where I could find some of those? Look in the book, Joy Harjo's uh, Reinventing the Enemy's Language. Uh, look online. Um, and I have my archives at Smith College, Gloria Steinem's uh, collection. And uh, I'm writing uh, because you are a different generation than the world that I grew up in, that your daughters grew, grew up in. And there are precious stories. When Ruth Hearn told me a story about uh, a special sign between my mother and father, she was close to my mother who was widowed when I was nine months old. My father died in the military. He was a fighter pilot in World War II. And the day he left for work and didn't uh, come home, which means that he passed on in a flight training, he, uh, he was training a cadet to fly at night and the uh, wheels didn't come down. And back then in the 50s, the planes carried their gas at the belly. So it was a dramatic moment. And before he left the house, the, their sign was this white lily. And there was a white lily growing out of the sink, Ruth said. And she said, your mother never told you the story of the white lily before. I said, no, but um, you mean it's the relationship to the, the lily of the Mohawks, that kind of thing. She said, no, this is different. So we do know that uh, woman's medicine can include um, the white lily root. And, and so just that fragment of a story is powerful. 
in how it carries something forward in the current of time, the threads will connect. There's a thread underlying the earth that holds what you do in a ceremonial manner, in a loving way, coming from this generative source within each one of you, that you can effect something in a positive way in yourself and in others. Uh, and so thank you for your encouragement uh, in written works. Um, I'm still writing while trying to, uh, I'll be writing more and it'll be on the spiritaligned.org website. But if you are heading home to give birth, watch your dreams. You, the images in your dreams are the language of your spirit. And in our old classical uh, uh, Six Nations way, a dream that provoked emotion and action, you would take it to one of the seers, right? And she would recommend different ceremonies. Uh, and so I've seen that in practice that uh, a woman presenting with a really powerful dream, that dream needs to be interpreted and treated. And you can direct her into one of the uh, ceremonial societies uh, a medicine society within our longhouse culture um, using the sacred fire and uh, you know again it implies a relationship to to the men in these different medicine societies so uh, anyway I encourage you um, that uh, I, I, I will I am encouraged by you to continue to write uh, my experiences it's uh, tricky. You want to keep confidentiality. And uh, however, some of the women have said, share. They've been so uh, deep, deeply affected by their experience. Um, and then I've told my journey as a midwife in the book, uh, Into Our Hands by Geraldine Simpkins, a colleague of mine. I have a chapter in that book. Um, other than that, just check online. Uh, how are we for time? We have about uh, 12 minutes left. Oh, good. Okay. So you have to pay attention to the threads. What do I mean by that? When she told me, uh, shared with me this image, I mean, it defies rationality that a white lily would be growing out of the kitchen sink. But I kept that as data from my own history related to midwifery. And it was not long after um, the, the difficult delivery of my eldest grandchild. Um, he ended up in a NICU in Buffalo. Uh, and it was quite a dramatic uh, balance between life and death and his response to having swallowed meconium. His was a hospital birth. Um, all of the elements that were brought together, the people who show up to help you um, and the people you can depend on. Uh, and so I realized affecting all that was necessary to pull that young life into this world uh, took seven ceremonies lined up between Guatemala and Okwazasne. It's just where my trail, my path, my intention took me to these realities of these medicines brought to bear on the life of my newborn grandson. And he lived uh, much to the surprise of the specialists. And uh, part of the doctoring was that we would thank the Sundance tree for the help we received in the prayer from multiple fireplaces. You can't mix the medicines, you have to line them up. And so having just come out of that experience and being over visiting a friend in a farm north of Minneapolis, St. Paul with my brother, Goyate, we heard that our eldest brother who had served in the military was severely ill with a, a lung infection for which the treatment was as dangerous as the illness. It could kill him. 
Luckily, they flew him into the vet hospital, newly renovated at Minneapolis St. Paul in an air ambulance. So my brother Tom and I left the home uh, of this friend who was about 40 minutes north of Minneapolis, that Louis was flown there instead of any other place in Texas or California or who knows where, but within an hour of where we were visiting. And on the way in the dark of the night, uh, the flight came in about two or three in the morning. We stopped at an all night grocery house, a grocery store where at, in April in the proto section, it was full of white lily flowers. And it's not the same white lily as we see in the waters of the wetland areas that we inhabit here at Akwesasne. Um, but nevertheless, it's a white lily. And I told Tom, we, we got to take snacks because once we get to that hospital, we're not going to be leaving. So we took the white lily and placed it in the space of his intensive care unit room with a fully glass door over the nurse's station. He was that sick. So our we bought a hotel room near the hospital with two queen beds so that our sister and our sister-in-law could stay and we'd be on call to go see Louis daily. I use a medicine of time that is a uh, a, a, a long life of training for my husband who is apprenticed in these ways and we followed them since the early 1980s um, integrated them into midwifery practice because time is a central element to everything just like water there's no uh, existence without it and so in the medicine of time um I told my family, we were all sleeping in that one room, watch your dreams tonight. It's going to be the ten keme, the day perfectly balanced, two hands of the ancestors. You can call on them and they can show up in your dreams. And so watch your dreams. Maybe we'll get some help for Louis. And early in the morning, just as the sun was breaking, my sister-in-law, Loretta Freda Bear Cook, who again will be featured at spiritalign.org because she's mind-blowingly deep in her language and her practice. And I've taken her to births. Um, she uh, popped up on the bed and said, sister-in-law had a dream. I, what did you dream? She said, I dreamt. You know, in Louis's room, the newly renovated room with the pastel colors, there's a watercolor on the wall. In the fog, there's a outline of a Navy destroyer, but as you coming, there's a dock on the edge of this water way, and there's a, a dock made of wood and skiffs arriving on this dock is, was your mother and father and they stepped out of the skiff onto the dock and they walked out of the painting into the room. And they put on either side of them, your father got on one side and your mother got on the other and put their hands under Louis's head. And I woke up and he said, come on, we're going to, to see Louis and he was intubated and wires everywhere and i had my brother tom stand just we positioned ourselves just as we'd seen in loretta's dream and we sang a good two hours just begging for him to return to become more alive again and uh, he lived for another 15 years or so and so an element like the white lily flower uh, that's embedded in the culture, uh, privileged information that can't be generally shared um, are in those threads. And if you're paying attention, you're gonna notice them. And if you're not, they're still gonna be there, but you're gonna miss something precious because they're connectors, just like our chromosomes on our genes are what can, what brings back 
the ancestral behaviors, ancestral, you know, capacities, what you're thinking about. And here, living here on Cook Road, I often um, see my ancestors' pictures and their representation within the larger kinship family, how those qualities, those personalities, the humor, those kind of things persist through time. And if it's that true, if, if that is true, then um, there is truth to be found in the poesis, the poetry of our language, our cultural ways, our dreams, our memories, our ceremonies. And birth, no mistake about it, is a ceremony. It has elements of ceremony, uh, fire, relationship, purification, uh, the medicines that go with it. Um, and so you learn those as you pray and move the prayer in the momentum of your life, uh, never losing uh, the, the sense of those threads at work unifying under the earth through time. And that's what's going to carry you. I know from my work as a midwife that each of us comes into the world with a purpose and knowing the calendar day of the Mayan ways of the days upon which you enter, those are the energies that bring you in. And it's part of the interpretation of the birth itself. And I've seen over time how these different birth uh, energies um, reflect in the life of these individual children born at home under the power of our ways. That was so beautiful to share with us, Gachi and Yahweh. Thank you oh. so much. Um, the, is there anything else you'd like to say to wrap up? Um, we are kind of short on time, but if there's anything else you want to say. Oh, you know, I can go on and on with stories. It's like in my Dura bag, there's, you know, stories. But I wish each of you uh, more aliveness in your day to day in this horrible pandemic. Uh, take good care and Ganalunkwa. Uh, I think highly of each one of you knowing that you showed up for a purpose in your own heart. Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay. And <laughs> well, everybody. Thank you. You too. All right. Thank you so much, everybody who joined us for this amazing panel. Really, I cannot thank Gachi enough. This was so informative and so wonderful. And thank you everybody who joined our other panels as well. We had a full weekend. Everything was so awesome to listen to. And just one last time, I would like to mention um, that AICH is a grassroots organization and your donations are what enable us to be able to continue to do um, panels such as this. So if you feel like it, you can donate to AICH.org slash donate. And once again, thank you everyone so much for showing up. And I believe that's it for the Women's Gathering Weekend. Thank you.